So far, we've been talking about distributed power sources, power that's produced by small independent sources, uh, produced near where it's used, and produced on the customer's side of the meter. Now we'll talk about various kinds of centralized power, and that means power that's produced at some centralized location and produced on the utility side of the meter. Here is a list of the various power sources that you might encounter in a centralized system. And we'll go through um, most of these. We won't talk about nuclear. We'll start with coal. Coal is common in some parts of the world and um, in the middle of the country and the east of the country. So here we burn coal to produce heat. That makes steam. That turns a turbine for a generator. As we discussed uh, last time, coal is about 33% efficient. So about 66-67% of the energy from burning coal gets discarded as waste heat. The big problem with coal uh, is pollution and of course greenhouse gas pollution is the very most dangerous. But we also have other kinds of pollutants. Uh, coal, it turns out, has heavy metals including mercury and lead. And it gives off high quantities of PM 2.5 particulates, which you know about. In the east coast of the US, uh, the majority of PM 2.5 comes from coal burning power plants. Out here in the West, in Washington and Oregon, the majority of PM 2.5 comes from wood burning. Coal is extracted, uh, so there's a pattern similar to petroleum and natural gas that you also find in coal where uh, we, we extract the easiest to get to least expensive first. And when that's done, then we turn to the harder methods. So we've pretty much extracted the easy to get to coal. And now we're going to methods like mountaintop removal, which besides its damage to the, the landscape, uh, does terrible damage to uh, streams and to the ecosystems on which we all depend and to the livelihoods of the people who live downstream. So bad news. <laughs> we talked earlier about using biogas from landfills in waste to energy plants. So I'll just mention it again since we're talking about um, centralized plants. And these plants uh, burn methane, which is produced by anaerobic bacteria. Methane is dangerous. Methane is very scary. And here's why. I think we looked at this chart uh, the first day of class, but here it is again. This is from the IPCC report. Um, and they have collected data on how much global warming potential do various greenhouse gases have compared to carbon dioxide. And if you consider carbon dioxide to have a global warming potential of 1, then over a 20-year period, methane is 86 times as much global warming potential. So it is really dangerous. This is why people are so alarmed about melting permafrost. And it's also why people are alarmed about the burning of natural gas and uh, biogas. So let's move on to a different kind of biofuel. And biofuel, uh, there's that word bio again. It's fuel made from plant material. And we can use various kinds of plant material as fuel. Here, uh, very close to LCC, is a biofuel plant. And here on the sign, it says you can get uh, bioethanol. You can get 10% bioethanol or you can get 85% bioethanol. 
So 10%, also known as E10, is 10% ethanol, which is ethyl alcohol, made from plant material, and then 90% regular old petroleum gasoline. And when you burn E10 in your car, uh, you won't notice any difference. You get, it, okay, it's slightly less uh, miles per, per gallon, but not, not so as you'd notice. Um, E85, that's 85% ethanol, does give you uh, fewer miles per gallon. And there's a slightly lower uh, power ratio. Well, what are we using for biofuel? Uh, in, the, in the US, we are using corn. In Brazil, they are using sugar cane. The problem with using biofuel made from corn, one of the big problems, is the impact of the fertilizer that's used on those crops. So farmers put a huge amount of nitrogen fertilizer on their corn fields so that it'll, the corn will grow real fast and big. Um, but most of that fertilizer doesn't actually get taken up by the plants. Most of it uh, runs off with the irrigation water into the Gulf of Mexico where it causes dead zones. And a dead zone is a place where uh, there's no oxygen in the water and animals can't live. In addition, uh, these corn crops for biofuel are chewing up farmland that could be used to produce food, so it leads to rising food prices. And it results in consuming large amounts of water from the Ogallala Aquifer. This aquifer is a fossil aquifer, which means the water was deposited millions of years ago. It's essentially considered non-renewable. And it's the largest known aquifer in the world. And the water level in this aquifer is being drawn down at a rapid rate uh, much of it due to growing corn for biofuel. So what else can we do? Well, uh, a lot of work is being done with plant materials that have uh, woody, woody cellulose in them. So it could be grasses, it could be trees. And then our friends, the bacteria, uh, the bacteria break down the cellulose and the lignin in these plant materials and use it to make alcohol. The little workhorses of the planet. Biodiesel is different from bioethanol. Biodiesel is oil. And um, you can get 2% biodiesel mixed with 98% diesel, and you won't notice any performance difference. You can also get B100, which is 100% biodiesel. My understanding is that an ordinary diesel engine cannot run on B100, that you have to do some retrofitting. Um, and we could ask our diesel technology folks at LCC more about this. So you can get oil for making biodiesel uh, from many places. There are various plant crops that produce vegetable oil. Uh, we just saw here in this previous slide, there's a rapeseed field. field. Um, soybeans produce that kind of oil. Uh, I have read about meadow foam, which produces canola oil. And around Eugene and some other parts of the country, you might, uh, when a diesel vehicle passes you, you might smell French fries. <laughs> That's because some people who've converted their engines to burn B B100 are using recycled cooking oil. So there's a little um, gig economy. People who go to fast food restaurants and collect their used cooking oil. That's good for the restaurant. And then the person... Um, uses that cooking oil, kind of processes it and cleans it up and converts it into biodiesel. There is also considerable research being done with algae who apparently, so these are 
they're not plants, they're not bacteria, they're their own uh, kingdom of life. And apparently they have a very high oil yield, so a lot of work is being done to see can we use this for producing biodiesel. Stay tuned.